Welcome to Whiskey and Wonder. All right, all right, all right, all right. We're jumping in hard and fast today. Hello, everybody. Hello, welcome to Whiskey and Wonder. You can see on the screen, I'm Tyler. I'm Megan. And we are Whiskey and Wonder. Those are our emails that just went away on YouTube. If not on YouTube, find those in the show notes. Um, we're here on episode 85, Megan. 85. That is incredible. It is. And if you're on YouTube, you notice there's been some changes in this, in where we record. If you're listening to us on audio, you don't see these, but you should. So Megan is trying very, very hard. <laughs> it's not I, working. <laughs> yeah, she's trying very hard to get out of the way so you can see it. I have rearranged yep. a lot of furniture in my house. Um, I have brought the whiskey cabinet in here. It's behind Megan now. I've taken everything that is not whiskey out of there, uh, with the exception of one item, um, and that was a gift from friend Morgan and friend Daniel, the wine that they uh, gave us. Delicious. So that is delicious. It is in there. Um, if you look on top of that, you'll see one of our infinity, infinity bottles. Uh, it's our bourbon one since we haven't, I don't think we've had anything else be put into an infinity bottle yet by your votes. Remember, if you do want to vote on what goes into the infinity bottles, go to patreon.com slash whiskey wonder to check all those out. Um, sign up for that and it'll give you the ability to vote in the poll each week, uh, on whether, whether what we did goes in the infinity bottle or not. Um, and then you can't see it on Megan's screen. Um, but hopefully if we have a guest here, you will be able to see it. I put some wall hangers up and mounted some guitars in here. You can see behind me over here. That's my newest one. And the other one, there's a mount uh, on the wall directly behind my head between beside the curtain where the other one goes. But she's currently at the guitar doctor getting a, uh, uh, checkup as it were. So anyway, I feel like that was a mouthful. Megan, you got anything was, to add to that? Uh, no. Okay. No, I, I think you covered like everything. Also, um, uh, we, up. Uh, I finally got the GoPros going as cameras. So Megan's quality should be up, should be a little bit higher now along with mine. So, um, yeah, let us know what you think about the changes. Yeah. You know, you find our contact information, all our social media stuff down in the show notes. I'll go through a couple real quick. Uh, email us, contact at whiskeyandwonder.com. Instagram is at whiskey podcast. Patreon.com slash whiskey and wonder if you want to vote on the infinity bottles or if you want to get early access and a bunch of other cool features. Um, check out whiskeyandwonder.com. We've got t shirts and uh, stickers and glassware. Whiskey yep. And all sorts of cool stuff. Yeah. Um, Working on some new designs for hopefully some hats or something. Yes, Megan is working working diligently on that. Um, check us out on YouTube so you can see all these changes. Just search Whiskey and Wonder and subscribe to us so we can get a nice posh uh, YouTube address. Something like YouTube.com slash Whiskey and Wonder. Because you have to have a certain number of subscribers to do that. And we're not there yet. So help us out. Subscribe. Please, please. Like, tell your friends, all that good stuff. Review, do all the things. Rate. We appreciate it. It helps out more than you know. Um, and we do want to thank uh, everyone who does already donate to the podcast, our Patreons, our people who go to our PayPal and send us some bucks every so often. You guys are what make this happen. You keep us funded. You're the real and, MVP, to yeah. quote Kevin Durant. Yes, <laughs> the real MVP. Yep. Um we kind of jumped a little out of order. We skipped the announcements there. Uh, mainly, uh, the only thing, I think I touched on all of it, except for the 5,000 listen celebration. Yeah, we're working on it. We are still working on that. Moving on. Yes, moving on past that. <clears throat> we'll just jump right in after that. The open segment. All, all right. right. Well, oh, <laughs> Jinx. jinx. Jinx, you owe me a soda. <laughs> oh, no. You froze. Oh, no. Oh, you froze. Hold on. All right, Megan, oh. talk to me while I while I do a green flag pit stop. Okay. Um, I can already feel you rolling your eyes and, like, cringing at me. 
But last night, um, I went over to a friend's house, um, and uh, it w- there was four of us there, um, and we ended up playing with dousing rods or divining rods, depending on uh, who you are um, and what you're looking at. And basically, uh, the rods we were messing with were uh, two copper rods that um, you hold gently in each hand, and then they move um scientifically they are supposed to point to where water is underground um there are some scientists who believe that it does that there are some who argue that it's coincidence um and uh they say it's like the magnets in the earth that are causing it um but then there are the um spiritual people who say that you can use these dousing rods to communicate with the dead which is, of course, what we use them for. Um, and it, we probably played with them for a couple of hours. Um, and I went into it 100% like not believing a damn thing. Like I thought it was, it was going to be cool and fun, but like totally false. Just like, okay, whatever. But I'm a little less skeptical now um i'm not gonna lie i mean maybe my aunt my my beliefs will be different tomorrow i'm sure they'll change back and forth all the time uh kind of like my beliefs do about everything um but there were some things that the rods knew that i did not expect uh the answers to be what they were um and it looks like Tyler was not successful at getting the video to work. Uh, so. I'm a- ah, yeah, great success. Oops. Oh, no, you're fucking it up. There we go. Okay. All right. So let me fill you guys in. All right. Real quick while Megan, uh, I'm going to interrupt for a second. It's quick. As soon as she said, uh, Dowling Rods, I went, Ugh. I don't think she heard it because her headphones were on. But no, I yes, didn't, there was but a, I knew. There I was knew. an audible. Ugh. Yes, I rolled my eyes hard. Um, I hope you guys didn't see what I did on, on the screen to make that, to make the camera work again, but we'll uh, <laughs> just go from there. Yep. Behind the scenes, maybe. Um, all right. Continue. Sorry. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> so, um, I mean, as a kid, you know, I played with Ouija board and it was very obviously like we were moving the thing around and blah, 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 like just stupid kid shit. And I thought that's how these divining rods would be. And um, try as I might, I could not get the rods to move in a way I wanted them to. Um, It seemed like 100% the rods were moving on their own and there were I don't know. There was things we asked, like, can you point to this person in the room? And the rods would immediately point to whoever it was. It was very, very odd coincidences or maybe something more. But that was my uh, experience last night, which was pretty cool. I'm not going to lie. I'm looking forward to going back over to this friend's house and playing with them some more. Um, So... I have actually used these before in a scientific setting um, just as a comparison. When I was in college, we did a ground penetrating radar survey of a of a um, state park nearby, a, a local area. There was a pre-Civil War town supposedly located and the park range, one of the park rangers thought that they had located where that town or remnants or artifacts was, and thought that the town was there and wanted us to come do some GPR as it's broke again. It broke again. Oh, hell. Uh, let me see if I can. Like okay. hell, you're going to be frozen. Oh, okay. I ain't dealing with that shit. We're going to figure this out. Okay. Um, Sorry, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, uh, hidden or lost. Yeah, yeah the lost town. city. We were supposed to found it or supposed to find it. And uh, so, yeah, had to come out there and do some GPR. And somebody brought those things out there. And it was very interesting to run an actual machine designed to find subsurface stuff. 
and to do these things because there were times when they were right. There were times when they were wrong. Um, so do I believe it's supernatural? No. Do I think there's something scientific that affects them? Like magnetic pull of a rock or something like that? Sure. I could see that. But I don't know. I, I, I didn't think to really climb on any surface rocks to see if they would affect it. But yes, I have used those. I don't think they're uh, supernatural by any stretch. So, Well, I knew you would roll your eyes at me, but yeah. I wanted to share with all of our listeners well, that I'm, experience. And it, it was a very cool experience. I'm glad you enjoyed them. Um, you know, I'd, I would strongly suggest take them outside in your backyard and see if you can find like a dead body or something buried. <laughs> <laughs> Supposedly that's what they're good for is finding shit in the ground. Um, I've had a, um, pretty, uh, I, it, it's been nothing. Subs- oh, Megan's froze again. Damn. <laughs> Chase. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, over and over and over. Um, I wonder if there's a way I can I can do that. I don't know. Just by going in here. Um, let me see. All right. Uh, today there this week was fairly boring. Yeah, it, uh, yeah. I I'm gonna have to keep doing that, guys. Sorry, you're gonna see just Megan pop up on the screen there. I'll get this problem sorted out before next week, or we'll go back to the old camera. Um, <clears throat> yes. So. It was a very boring week. Uh, I worked an event yesterday for the brewery up in Greensboro. I've wanted to go to this event for a while, and I worked it and didn't get to do anything there except pour beer. I mean, um, if you're working it, you yep, can't enjoy it. Yep. So uh, it was really fun, though. My shout-out to friend Katie. I don't know if uh, she's listening. I know she's listened to one or two episodes, um, but I hope you're feeling better today. She slipped getting out of the van and hit her head on Ooh, the van and took a shit. Yeah, gave herself a nice little cut. Um, uh Lord. We might have to Um, where am I at? There we are. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> so shout out to Katie. Hope you're feeling better. Hope your head's not hurting as much today and that you yep. you got the blood out. I hope you were okay, friend Katie. Um, we took a, I, I bought a new mattress and it came uh, yesterday while I was at the event. So thanks to Shelby for accepting that delivery and it had an, a, a free adjustable base with it. And of course the adjustable base didn't fit in my bed. So I had to saw an eighth of an inch off of the piece of plywood that is the top of the adjustable base to get it to fit in there and after you've worked a festival all day, just not what you want to do. Um, oh. So that that was pretty much the highlight of my week. So all right, I'll uh, other than moving moving shit around and all that this week. But all right, um, I also will shout out real quick to my part. Um, it was his thirty second. thirty two. Awesome years, and here's to many, many, many more. Yeah, happy birthday, Houston. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't muster much more emotion. Right. I'm a little, You're I'm a little, little, I'm a little frustrated right I now. Can, so, I can tell. All right, so we're going to pause. Yep. We'll come back. We'll and, be back for opening the bottle. Yes, we will. So, in, All right, we're back after a brief break, and now we're going into opening the bottle. Opening the bottle. As I'm sure, as, as you guys can tell by my tone, <laughs> I lost the battle. And do, you, do you need a drink, Tyler? <laughs> I need a freaking drink. Uh, the GoPro does not want to cooperate. I don't know if it's overheating or what exactly. I don't have a battery in it, so it shouldn't be overheating from everything I've read. But we have the old camera back on Megan for the time being. So That's okay. I will we'll, survive. We'll get there one day when I can figure this crap out. Anyway, Megan, 
All right. What are we drinking today? Take it away. All right. Um, this week we are drinking a bourbon. Now, fun fact, and something I'm going to have to correct, correct us both on, apparently a bourbon can be made anywhere. It's not limited to Kentucky. I thought bourbons had to be made in Kentucky. Yeah, me too. But it turns out Kentucky bourbons have to be made in Kentucky, and bourbons can be made from wherever. So this is a bourbon from California. So I would like to take a minute and say thanks. Uh, I mentioned her earlier on the podcast, friend Katie and her husband, friend Matt, who uh, is from California, gave this to us to try. Um, and I, when she sent me the picture of it, I, I was like, huh, that's interesting because it's from California, but it says it's a bourbon. Uh, I thought bourbons only came from Kentucky. That's what I thought. So, yeah. I think that's what we've told you guys for th- 85 I, episodes. I think it is too. So we looked it up. And found kind of conflicting answers, honestly. Yeah. So, I don't know. That, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know, guys. But this is called Lost Republic. Um, it is distilled in Heddlesburg, California. And on their website, they say that we are devote. I, I think it's Heldsburg. Heldsburg. Heddle, Held. Oh, it is Held. I... My dyslexia switched the D and the L. It is Heldsburg, not Heddle. That's why I was very confused. Heldsburg. Um, Heldsburg Diamonds, not a sponsor. <laughs> but would you like to sponsor us? Email. Um, we're devoted to making delicious craft whiskey to drink with friends, friends of friends, and those who like to celebrate the independent spirit. Lost Republic Distilling Company was founded by Colin Harder and Matthew Wees in 2013. Growing up best friends in Sonoma County and being surrounded by beautiful vineyards and terrain, the two had a vision of creating California's craft brown water and the spirit that goes with it. At Lost Republic, we aim to deliver California's highest quality craft whiskey. It was a simple dream that is now being distilled into reality and a delicious one at that. Cheers. Um, and let's see, their master distiller is Matt Weiss. He is a former winemaker at Dry Creek Valley, and he has a keen focus on the distillation and blending process. His attention to detail during the blending process gives our whiskey flavor, complexity, and depth. Using premium air-dried white oak barrels opposed to the more common kiln-dried oak barrel, Our whiskey stands out in quality. Using larger copper pot stills, we are able to control the consistency of our product while still remaining craft. And today we are drinking their bourbon, um, their straight bourbon. However, they appear to have uh, a rye as well. Um, And then they have some cask strength bourbon and rye. And that's, yeah, it looks like uh, they say that their bourbon focuses on the subtleties and complexities of the fermentation and distillation. Innovative barrel maturation program allows the flavors of corn and rye to shine through. Our pure distillate, void of any flaws, makes an outstanding bourbon. So I wanted to get to the bottom of this. So I went to the American Bourbon Association website. They would be the authority. There are many factors that make a bourbon whiskey a singular and distinct spirit. Um, Presence of strict rules and regulations for production. Um, So, uh, requirement is for new charred oak barrels. All natural, no additives. Um, Apparently, Canadian, Scotch, and Irish all add uh, color and flavor additives. Can add. Um... Let's see. The recipe bourbon consists of at least 51% corn. Um, other grains are added. Some type of whiskeys may only use one grain. Uh, straight for bourbon to be designated straight bourbon whiskey, it must have aged in new charred oak barrels for a period of at least two years, which this is a straight bourbon. So 
Uh, bottled in bond, must have been made during a single distilled season at one distillery, aged in a federally bonded warehouse for a period of at least four years, and bottled at 100 proof as originally defined in the Bottled in Bond Act of 1897. So, apparently, you don't have to be... It's got to be produced in the U.S., okay. but not Kentucky to be a bourbon. So, All right. we're at the bottom of that mystery. So, um, I smelt it, smelled it. I did not smelt it. Smelled, smelled, it. smelled, and I got a lot of corn. First thing I noticed was corn. Yeah, corn. Um, um, I'm getting a lot of citrus, very California. Um, like I'm getting orange, lemon, um, kind of like just sunshiny smells. Um, a bit of corn. Um, not much burn in the nose. No, not much at all. Um, maybe a little bit of like a grape or a, like a green grape or a green apple or some sort of green fruit. Um, hmm. but I mean, that's, so I'm not going to lie. For me. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I've chronicled my nose issues on here before. <laughs> yes. um, so at the moment, my good side of my nose is not working, and the bad side of my nose is the one that's working. So I'm not really trusting what I'm getting. Um, okay, well, tell us what you're getting anyway. Like I said, a lot of corn. Some sweet... Like your typical bourbon, vanilla, caramely sweetness, but okay. that that's about it. That's all I'm getting. Um, that darn deviated septum. Yeah, it's 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 a bastard when it's blocking up the good side of my nose. Yep. Or when something is. So we are supposed to be smelling a uh, toasted oak, apple, lemon peel, and allspice. All right, so I'd say I get some. Apple and lemon peel. Um, not really getting allspice, really. I'm not really getting any of the oak either. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll see. I'm, what are you, I'm what not are you getting, thinking? I'm not getting any of the fruit at all. Nothing. None. It is very fruity it, to me. It smells very bland to me. Interesting. Yeah. It's very citrusy, very fruity to me. I don't know if that's because of my nose issues at the moment or... Or I just can't smell. You're just, or your palate is just like, no, nah, don't, no, it's not good. In, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. So Tyler's going to go ahead and take a sip here as I let it spin around my glass a little. Um, and I don't know. He's looking a little contemplative. I got the fruit right on the tip of the tongue. Um, to me, it was more apple. Then we switched over into um, a very oaky, kind of leathery, and then it had a subtle burn on the finish, but uh, very, very much a noticeable vanilla on the finish as well. Okay. Um, I'm... Definitely getting fruit. Um, I get both lemon and orange. Um, something a little bit sweeter, too. Probably like a grape, I would say. Um, and then I get a bit of that oak uh, taste. The burn was at the back. It was at the end. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting to me because the burn for me lingered like a... Spicy food burn. Like it didn't really travel down my throat or anything. It stayed as if I like bit into a, like a, a pepper. Like it stayed in your, on your tongue? It stayed on my tongue. It's, it's oh, still it, on mine, my tongue. Mine's down here. That's mine's weird. in the back of my throat. Mine is 100%. still on my tongue. I can like point exactly on my tongue where the burn is. That's so weird. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not getting a ton, a ton of mouth burn. Uh, I took another sip and I... I maintain I, I don't get the orange or the lemon out of it. And you're not getting mouth burn. Not really. 
I'm getting only mouth burn and no burn when it goes down, but it's a lingering mouth burn. Like eating hot salsa and you're done, but that link filling is still there. That is literally what I'm getting from this. So I'm getting mouth burn now because I just swished it under my tongue, but that is only, I always, it always burns when I put it under my tongue. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, hmm. yeah, it's not. I'm not getting any mouth burn. Uh, now, it is only 91 proof. So, you know, maybe that maybe that uh, speaks a little bit to me drinking a little higher proof things, typically. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, as many sips as I take, like, the, the mouth burn is not going away. So, maybe that is your more into the higher proof stuff so your mouth is like more trained to ignore it um as for flavor um i don't get like a vanilla or caramel or like a typical bourbon flavor i get all the sweet for me is coming from fruit um oh i don't not from candy I i get a little apple on the front end i don't get any um i don't get any uh, citrus at all, and it, I have a strong vanilla presence hmm. lingering and like right as it goes down my throat. Mm, disagree. Very weird. Um, Apparently, this is a polarizing whiskey. Very weird. Um, we are supposed to be tasting biscuit, and I'm guessing it's biscuit like American biscuit, not not a you know UK. Well, cookie. we are in America, and this is an American this whiskey. Is an, a bourbon, so. so. So, biscuit, cherry, banana, white pepper, uh, creme brulee. And this is from their website? This is from their website. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh-huh, uh-huh real subtle. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't get a single one of those. I don't know how they got cherry. Um, no, not at all. So I've got a, I've got another person's review up here. Okay. Tell me what they say. They said thin body, moderate tongue burn (laughs) flavor is fleeting, mostly in the realm of cinnamon candy and cake batter. No. Um, the finish is medium long, a lot of sugar, caramel toffee appears on the finish with a maple. Oh, Jesus. Maple tinged. Funny Greek focus, F U N U G R E E K. I don't know what that word is, uh, and fades without much bitterness. No, disagree with everything that said. Really wrong. I disagree with the one you read. The only thing that I really agree with this is that the flavor is fleeting. It it comes and goes really quick, mm-hmm. and there's definitely something sweet on the back end. That's all I agree with out of either one of those. All right, the uh, polarizing whiskey. Apparently, everyone's palate hits a little bit different with this one. Yeah, that's interesting. Because yeah, definitely, definitely not getting cherry, not getting cake batter, um, not getting caramel toffee, any of that stuff. I'm not getting banana. I'm not getting cherry. Um, I guess maybe the sweetness could be creme brulee if I want to be like schwanky about it. But I don't think I've ever had creme brulee, so. It's custard. Have you had custard? I have. Custard. Custard's basically vanilla. Yeah. 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 <laughs> basically. It's like vanilla like, that's like been basically, cooked. Yeah, basically you're splitting hairs there, but whatever. Um, okay. Well, we'll keep, we'll keep sipping. That's very, yeah, like you said, very curious that it's hitting everybody different. I'll, uh, I'll move us along then. It's time for the wonder segment. I think that's two weeks in a row during that drop that it's crackled. I hope it's only crackling for us and not it's recording. Not, it's not. It's recording too. What the hell? So I apologize for that crackle. I'll figure it out and see what it is. That's so weird. All right. Well, Tyler, you did a wonder segment today. So you've been a busy little bee. Yes, I have. Rearr- learn, learn rearranging me. the room and doing the research and watching the race. So. 
Uh, I'm going to start by saying I originally had a, had a title for this one, mm-hmm. but the more I got into it, the, the more I felt like that title wasn't appropriate. So I'm curious on what your opinion of what the title should be. Okay. Is towards I will, end. I will so. hold on to my opinions. All right. So humans have been using the stars for millennia, ah, millennia. Ancient people used them to navigate, uh, while now we use them to learn about our universe and where exactly we might fit in it. Even when Galileo built his first telescope, or first built his telescope, the main thing he looked at was the night sky and not his neighbor undressing. (laughs) Humans have a weird obsession with space and our universe, and I am no different. Oops. Oops. So... Last week, I'm sure a lot of y'all know that the first images from the James Webb Space Telescope came back, came to us. So freaking amazing. Yes, they are. Oh my God. Amazing. I thought it would be interesting to take a look at how we got to this point and talk a little bit about just how amazing these images are. And I want to start by taking a brief look at what a telescope is and when and how it was invented and a little bit of the principles behind them. Okay. So the first telescope was invented in the Netherlands in 1608, and it was quite simply just a tube with curved glass lenses inside that refracted light, and that made objects appear larger when they were focused at the right focal point, which is basically the length. Um, Refraction, simply the turning or bending of a wave, And in the case of telescopes, a wave of light. The idea quickly spread across Europe and Galileo, Galilee heard about it and tried to make his own version. Galileo, Galilei? Oh, whatever. Galilee, Galilei. I thought thought the song was named after him. Puff Puff the Magic Dragon. Didn't he go to Galilee? I... (laughs) I don't know anyway. I've always heard Galileo, Galilei. Okay, whatever. Galileo. Uh, Anyway, Galileo succeeded and made several improvements to the design in the process. Within a few decades uh, of the refracting telescope, the reflecting telescope was invented. A reflecting telescope uses two mirrors, one of which is curved instead of glass prisms, to produce a larger image. So using glass, if, if it creates what's known as chromatic aberration or color distortion, so to everybody out there, I know this applies to you, Megan. Have you ever taken a picture with a camera and had it come out with a blurry red and blue and yellow outlines around the subjects? Um, something like this. Ha ha. If you're on YouTube, oh, I have pictures. Sure. You did it. I did. So that is an example of chromatic aberration. Uh, see these. Uh, you can't see my mouse, so I don't know why I'm pointing. But <laughs> there's the blue <laughs> lines below the horse and the red lines and the yellow lines around the head of the horse and around its butt and tail. Um, that is chromatic aberration. So Very cool. if you've ever taken a picture and seen that, that's chromatic aberration. That's caused uh, because when light passes through a single lens, different wavelengths of light, a.k.a. different colors, all have different focal lengths. So... Another diagram. Check that out. Look at you getting all swanky and yeah. shit. Yeah. So basically, red light travels at a slower speed than blue light. And so you get those, depending on the, fo- it creates different focal lengths. So, um, Sir Isaac Newton, who was studying light at the time and was theorizing that white light is composed of a spectrum of colors built the first reflecting telescope in 1668. Uh, The quick description of the design is that there's a wider tube that is open on one end and enclosed on the other end. And there are mirrors placed inside. Uh, Second mirror is placed uh, where this image is focused and angled to reflect the image to an... Ah, I'm sorry. my, my, My tempo was off there. A second mirror is placed where this image is focused and angled in order to reflect the image to an eyepiece. Newton's telescope eliminated chromatic aberration, but introduced coma optical aberration, 
And basically, it meant that the shapes were distorted at short focal lengths. In 1721, John Hadley, who was an English mathematician, improved on Newton's design by using a parabolic mirror instead of just a flat mirror. A parabolic mirror is basically just a curved mirror. The curve in the mirror would allow for the reflected shapes to not be distorted, producing more accurate images to be sent to the eyepiece. Guess what? I got another one. You got another diagram? Look yeah. at you, Tyler. So, this end's open. This is the mirror. This, oh, God, Jesus. So on the, oh, yeah, I'm pointing with my mouse here. On the right-hand side is the mirror, the curved blue thing, and this little angular blue thing here is the other mirror. So the light comes in, it hits here, reflects to this mirror, and then bounces into the eyepiece. So this curve played an important, a vital role in, uh, making sure that things weren't distorted. So now you get our ugly mugs again on YouTube. <laughs> um, in the early 1910s, George Willis Ritchie. Oh, nice. What a swap. Megan with the sneaky swap there. <laughs> I was trying to be sneaky and then you called it out. Sorry. Uh, George Willis Ritchie uh, and Henri uh, Cretine invented the Ritchie Cretine telescope or the RCT. That's what I'm going to call it because I can't say his name. The idea wasn't adopted widely until the 1950s, but now almost all large professional research telescopes use this basic design. Light comes into a large tube, two slightly curved mirrors, or hits two slightly curved mirrors, which reflect uh, one to the outs. Uh, one. Guess what? You have another diagram. I do, but I got to go back to the screen for it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, on the top, let's let's take the top one first. I'm going to I'm going to assume everybody's going to YouTube for this. Light comes in, it hits a slightly curved mirror. It bounces back and hits the outside of another curved mirror and then bounces to a focal length. And you have beams of light, you have two setups. So basically you have a slightly bent one on top and bottom. Light comes in, hits both of those, hits the single outside of the single curved mirror and then bounces to a focal plane, which is F on the diagram here. So that produces a much more uh, uh, professional grade image at the end of the day, more resolution, you can get more light, so on and so forth. Um, from Newton's telescopes onward, the aperture of telescopes begin widening, which allows for more light inside the telescope. Uh, basically, it's got a wider, uh, in, in photography, aperture is how wide your your lens basically gets, so it'll let you, Megan, you're better with that, so <laughs> tell me if I'm wrong, but it, it there's so, like a little shutter inside. Yeah, the aperture yeah. is the shutter, Shutter. Um, yeah. and it controls how much light goes into the camera, um, and that will change, um, It can it affects a lot of things. The more light you let in, the uh, in terms of space, at least the further away you can see, the more the more information. The way it was explained to me when I was in college, the more information you can gather into the telescope. So you can see better things. You need you a, can see it more. It's more macro. You get more detail closer yes. up. Yes. Yes. Further away, you want to be a smaller aperture. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You yes. confused me on your wording. Then. Yeah. Sorry. I I was always told that you wanted to have the biggest, not the aperture, just the... Uh, think of it like the outside of the lens. Instead of having the outside of your lens be this big, you want the outside of your lens to be this big. So you For can... For a geologist, I would definitely see that. Yes. It, because it, you want well, more detail this, on the rock. This was no, this wasn't geology. This oh. was this was astronomy and yeah, like hmm. because it lets more light in. I don't know. That's just what I was always told. I don't know okay. if I don't know exactly how to explain it. Um so where was I at? Uh, more light goes in the better oh I'm sorry, the more light that goes in the better the picture quality and in terms of space, the farther you can see. Maybe that's wrong. I don't know. Well T B D. Uh, now that we've talked a little bit about the history of telescopes, let's dive into the history of one of the most revolutionary telescopes that's ever been invented. The Hubble? The Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble 
was launched into the Earth's low orbit in 1990, where it remains today. It's still functional and throughout its life has brought us unprecedented images, excuse me, and data uh, from space, which has helped drive modern astronomy and astrophysics forward. Literally. And figuratively. (laughs) Maybe not. Uh, The story of the Hubble begins in 1923, where Herman Oberth, who is known as the father of modern rocketry, along with Robert H. Goddard and Constant... I think it's Constantine uh, Sajolkovsky. Sajolkov... Oh, Lord, I'm not even going to try again. (laughs) Constantine published a... (laughs) published a paper that explained how a telescope could be propelled into Earth's orbit via a rocket. A second paper was published in 1946 by Lyman Spitzer, who also discussed the main advantages that a space-based observatory would have over regular ground-based observatories. Basically, it wouldn't have light pollution. Um, Spitzer would spend most of his uh, career advocating for the use and development of a space telescope. After the U.S. National Academy of Sciences recommended that a space telescope be part of the space program, Spitzer was appointed as the head of a committee that was responsible for defining the objectives of a space telescope. Dr. Nancy Grace Roman, nicknamed the mother of Hubble, was another significant person in the creation of the Hubble. Dr. Roman lectured about how valuable a space-based telescope would be to the scientific community long before the Hubble was even an official project. Are you raising your hand? Oh, no, I'm oh, okay. playing with my ring and listening. To okay. it. I fidget when I listen. Gotcha. Dr. Roman uh, would go on to be the program scientist for the project. And in this role, she worked to set up the committee that was in charge of making sure that, uh, making sure that astronomer needs were met by the project. Uh, she also wrote to Congress in order to petition for more funding for the program. And her works on this project went on to set many standards for the way that NASA would handle large scientific projects in the future. So she kind of set the bar for NASA when it came to how they go about large science projects. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit here because there's a lot of bureaucratic back and forth uh, with Congress about justifying the funds for such a project. But uh, NASA Administrator James Fletcher did a very uh, gutsy move and he proposed a $5 million allowance in NASA's budget for the project, but he then chose to quote zero it out end quote of the budget as if they had run out of money when never actually intending to put that 500, five, what did I say? 5 million. Yeah. That $5 million towards it. He said he thought that doing this would inspire the scientific community that did support the telescope to lobby Congress to help raise funding. And it actually worked. Astronomers and scientists wrote letters and met in person with senators and congressmen, which ultimately led to the Senate approving half of the originally proposed budget, which they were still bickering about. So he said, looking back, I didn't run it by anybody. I just kind of did it and I probably shouldn't have, and I wouldn't do it again. So It is better for us for forgiveness than for permission. Sometimes. Ultimately, in 1978, Congress approved a budget of $36 million, and it was decided that the telescope would be named after Edwin Hubble, the scientist who confirmed that the universe is expanding. I'm not going to bore everybody with the construction, so we'll skip to the launch. Uh, the Hubble was launched in 1990 after delays because of the Challenger disaster. Long-time listeners, you're going to remember we talked about that in episode 17. Uh, Wow. uh, Yeah, Challenger in Columbia was episode 17. That was episode 17? Yes. Wow, Tyler, we've been doing this a hot minute. I know. That was when I had COVID that week. That was, we did it virtually. Yep. Um, I think that was before we were on YouTube even. Yeah, it was. Um, So once shuttle flights resumed after the uh, Challenger disaster, um... On April 24th, 1990, Space Shuttle Discovery successfully launched the Hubble into orbit. Um, Within weeks of its launch, it was discovered that there was a serious problem with the images that they were getting. Somebody done did make an oopsie. 
Uh, the issue stemmed from the curved mirror being about 220 nanometers. That's a one eleven thousandth of an inch. Oh my God. That's a, a size I can't even physically imagine. Yes. It was one eleven thousandth of an inch too flat. And for you non-Americans out there, I didn't convert that. Sorry. It's you <laughs> couldn't see that much with your naked eye. Wait, I have the conversion. 220 nanometers. <laughs> hey, dun dun. You literally have a I literally have a thing. I forgot. Yes, you're fired. I sorry. Uh it was impossible to replace the mirror in orbit, and it would cost too much to bring it back to Earth and replace it, so many thought that the Hubble would just be abandoned. But a solution was developed. It lives. Uh, and frankly, it was a pretty complicated solution, and I didn't even understand it, so I can't, I can't even pretend to explain it here. Okay. Can you kind of, like, dumb it? Did, did we bring the telescope back? Nope. They fixed it in space. They fixed it in space. Did they have an astronaut? like mess with it or yeah. did they like digitally fix it? No, or, no, they or, had astronauts or, go do it. They basically, um, it sounded like they took some other components that it, that like it had a, uh, um, Oh, what was it called? Not a hadron collider, high powered. Uh, I don't know they took other scientific components out because they didn't have the room to mount the things that they needed to mount. Somehow they mounted more, mirrors to offset the focus or the the error in that the one error. mirror. Yeah, that was kind of what I the way I understood it, but it okay. it wasn't clear to me. So very scientific stuff. You you ha you you need to be a rock and scientist to understand it. Bro, they're dealing with <laughs> one eleven thousandths of an inch. Yeah, it, that margin of my, error I would think would not matter, but it's over my head, dog. <laughs> All right. So <sighs> By 2002, all the issues had been resolved. Um, flash forward to 2022, and the Hubble is still functioning, but it's officially now outdated, and it's been replaced by the James Webb Space Telescope. But before we move on to talk about that, I want to list some of the Hubble's largest contributions to science and astronomy. The Hubble in remembrance. Uh, he's still kicking up there. I mean, are we ever going to use them again? Absolutely. They're not done using them yet. Oh, well, okay. Um, I saw a picture from it today. Um, so, number one, the Hubble assisted in teaching scientists that the universe is 13.7 billion years old. It helped scientists discover how planets are formed. It discovered that almost all galaxies contain supermassive black holes. It found four moons around four moons around Pluto, not floor four. <laughs> it detected a distant supernova that suggests that the universe recently began speeding up, and it detected the first organic molecule on a planet outside of our solar system. So, let's move on to what replaced the Hubble, the Day WST. And I'm not saying the whole name every time because that's too long. The JWST was launched on Christmas Day in 2021. Merry Christmas. It was designed to view objects that are either too old, too far, or too faint for the Hubble to view, essentially making it the successor to the Hubble. The JWST has greatly improved infrared resolution and sensitivity, which allows for better resolution photos from longer distances. And man, as we said when we, when we started this, if you have not seen these pictures, pause what you're doing. Pause us right now. Unless you're driving. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do it if you're driving. We'll finish. Go check out some pictures of it. Check out the James Webb Space Telescope photos. They are incredible. You, you have never seen the heavens the way that you see them from this picture. No, not at all. Um, and I take a comparison photo of like the Hubble and what it captured versus what the James Webb captured. It is yes. It is astronomical the amount it's, of it's detail uh, to, that uh to go to give you a layman's layman's comparison. It's like going from your old square 
boxy TV to the to the old folk that remember those, the CRT TVs to a 4K flat screen with UHD. That's the freaking equivalent. You're making yeah. that jump from the Stone Age to current times. Yeah. Because seriously, if you think about the dates and the times, we still had CRT TVs in two in nineteen. They let's just say two thousand two, because yeah. that's when they uh, had all the issues resolved. So two thousand two, in twenty years, we've come from CRT TVs to four K, Ultra HD, uh, QLED, all this other crap that these abbreviations. I don't know what they mean. It Anyways, means it looked good. Yeah. Yeah, if it's filmed right. Um, so yeah, go go do yourself a favor and go check those pictures out. It is it is worth worthwhile. Amazing. So the creation of the JWST was led by NASA with some help from the European Space Agency, who also helped with the Hubble, by the way, uh, and also the Canadian Space Agency. The JWST will hopefully allow astronomers to view and study some of their first stars and galaxies, some of the first stars and galaxies ever created during the Big Bang. And scientists also hope to uh, find potentially habitable exoplanets as well. The JWST's mirror is very unique in that it is made up of 18 hexagonal mirror segments made of gold-plated beryllium. This creates a 21-foot mirror, which is almost three times the size of the Hubble's. Ooh, excuse me. And that mirror gives the JWST around 25 meters squared of light collecting area. I'm sorry, square meters of light collecting area, which is about six times the light collecting area of the Hubble, which was four square meters. Wow. Ast- astronomical. Yes. Astrophysical, dude. <laughs> Gnarly. (laughs) The initial design for the JWST began in 1996 for a potential launch in 2007, but constant delays and budget issues kept pushing the date back. The typical bureaucratic bullshit. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was also a complete redesign in 2005, which pushed it back even further. Like they scrapped what they had and was like, all right, we can do this better. Yep. Yep. Nice. So the JWST is designed primarily for near-infrared astronomy, and this allows it to see objects that are 100 times fainter than what the Hubble can see. I mentioned early, uh, earlier that the JWST hopefully will be able to see some of the first stars and galaxies ever created. Scientists think that the, first, the earliest stars formed between 100 and 180 million years after the Big Bang. I almost said Big Bang Theory. After the Big Bang. <laughs> while the first galaxies formed about 270 million years after the Big Bang. So this is where we get a little tricky, and this, this might get a little complicated. Just now? If, well, if you know anything about the physics of light, you understand. You'll understand what I'm about to say. If not, I'm, I'm going to try to explain it really easily. So <sighs> please let me know if I'm confusing you. Because uh, I don't expect that you know this. Okay. So I don't think I do. Okay. So we've all heard about the speed of light, I assume. Yes. That tells us that it takes time for light to travel from point A to point B. Yes. And scientists have calculated that the speed of light is about 300,000 kilometers per second. So it takes light one second to travel that 300,000 kilometers. Yes. So let's say that we live on a planet that's 9,000 kilometers away. It takes that light, let's just say it's coming from a star, it takes light three seconds to get from that star to our planet. So when we look at that light source, we're seeing it... In the past. Three seconds in the past. Yes. Yes, okay. Good, you follow what I'm saying. I believe I explained this on an episode... 56, The Wonders of Space. Okay. I think I did. If I didn't explain it, I researched it. If not, if this is a refresher, then congratulations. You're a long-time listener. I'm sorry. I keep doing this. I have something in my eye. (laughs) Um, So, um, we probably talked about it in that one as well, but have you ever heard that if the sun just randomly stopped producing light, that we would have eight minutes and 20 seconds of light before we knew it stopped producing? Yep. Uh, it's the same principle. 
The, if you look at the sun in the sky, which I don't recommend doing, it'll don't. it'll blind you. Yeah, don't do that. You're seeing the sun eight minutes and twenty seconds ago. Um, now the same principle applies if you take and look at galaxies and stars that are light years away. Yes. So if you essentially are looking back in time at these. So you're seeing, literally, yes. If you, let, let's say it takes, you know, however many billion years for the light to reach earth. You're seeing it, you know, let's say it, the, the universe is, hold on. I've got it. It in was 13 point yes, something 13. billion. 7. The light being emitted from the galaxy to, uh, nope. I was skipping ahead. Uh, I'm getting off my thing. If you look at the sun, yep. If you take this and apply it to galaxies and stars that are billions of light years away, you're looking back in time at these stars and galaxies. If the light takes a billion years to reach Earth, then you're actually seeing the light that left that planet a billion years ago. Yeah. And we Not won't today. we won't see today until a billion years from now. From now, yeah. So you're looking into the past. Yes. It's incredible. It's an incredible principle. It really is. And and I hope I did that justice. If not, I, email me. I think you did it justice. Okay. I, I get got, it. I got Megan and that was the one I the main person I wanted to <laughs> I get but it. I think I think you have researched that before. So. Yes. Anyway, back to the uh the old JWST. In addition to having uh the capability to observe things that are very far away, it can also observe things within our own solar system. So uh, I saw what was quote unquote the most detailed photo of Jupiter that we've ever seen, and my God, was it amazing! Uh, you you guys really y'all gotta go check these pictures out. They are just out. They're amazing. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, you're, you're literally going from like shitty standard def to 4K. Yeah, ultra high definition. Yeah, it, it, it's incredible, but. Anyway, oh, uh, since amazing. since the JWST only started receiving images back last week, I don't really have that much else to report on it. I just thought it'd be pretty cool to look at both it and the Hubble and telescopes in general. Um, hopefully in time, you know, the JWST will produce its own miraculous and marvelous discoveries just like the Hubble did, and it'll mm -hmm. teach us so much more about the universe and things we don't know. Maybe, yeah. maybe we'll see some aliens... Waving. Waving like they did in Futurama <laughs> with cowboy hats. So anyway, that's that's my story and I'm okay. sticking to it. All right. Very cool. Um, so uh, eight months ago, almost to the day, um, we released episode 56. So on November 15th of 2021, episode 56 dropped. Um, and that was my wonder segment where I talked about the wonders of space. And we talked a little bit about time dilation um, and kind of what all that means. Um, and I'm thinking here probably in a couple of years, I'm going to have to redo the wonders of space episode when we get this new information from the James Webb space telescope. Um, because who knows what wonders we're going to find in the next couple of years when we've already seen like so much more detail and just the first images they've ever released. That I didn't even think about that, but that yeah, absolutely. Um, honestly, I kind of forgot we did that episode. Yeah. <laughs> there, have been, there have been so many episodes, I'm forgetting what topics we've covered. I mean, it has been <laughs> a very, very long time ago, like yeah, eight months. That's a while. Yeah, I know that it's been a long eight months too. Yeah, it has. Um, so anyway, I guess we'll jump out of this wonder segment unless you have anything else to add. What about what about a name? Because um, uh, originally I was going to call it the James Webb Space Telescope, and I don't feel like I covered it as much. But, I would, but the history of telescopes just doesn't seem very attractive of a name. I would, it. I don't like the James Webb Telescope name. I don't think that's enough because it's so new. I think the history of telescopes. I think, I think that's what I mean. The history of telescopes, the science. The science, the science of telescopes. Of telescopes. There, oh, there we that's, go. That's why the science. That's why we keep Megan around. Hey, hey it's not just the hair. <laughs> uh, yes, that and your lovely radio voice. Yes, Mine. I am built for radio. Yeah, my my voice is uh, 
very low today after talking with all those people yesterday and talking. It was a very crowded event, so I was almost yelling. You know, my voice is just kind of hoarse. Excuse me. Can I talk to you today about all those goals? Excuse me. (laughs) I can't even. Can I talk to you about our Lord and Savior, the (laughs) James Webb Space Telescope? (laughs) All right, we're moving on. Trivia with Tyler. All right. Tyler, give me a Tyler nugget to chew on. Uh, (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) I just looked at my phone and um, I got a text from friend Katie that said, where's my how are you feeling today text? So it's in this podcast episode, Katie. That's where it is. Um, All right. So uh, hold on. I still have GoPro stuff up. Oh, my God. Uh, All right. So on June 10th, 1898, mathematician Alice Lee barged into a meeting of the All-Male Anatomical Society and measured the skull of 35 of the most well-regarded anatomists uh, who, uh, I'm sorry. Anatomists? Anatomists, yes. Measured uh, the skulls of 35 well-regarded anatomists. She found that they had very small, or the most well-regarded had the smallest skulls. And these anatomists, how do you say that word? Anatomist. An- anatomist. Ana- I will keep wanting to say anatomist. An- anatomist. Anatomist. These anatomists believed that skull size determined intelligence. Basically, Oof. they all had little tiny heads, and they thought big heads meant you were smart. And this lady that they wouldn't let in. And Alice said, oh, really? Alice said, yeah, okay, you guys got a bunch of pea heads. <laughs> so, anyway, sorry. Size doesn't matter. Sure. Final thoughts. Wow. This has been a fun episode and a fun bourbon. I've enjoyed it as I've sipped on it and I've enjoyed the wonder segment and everything today. That was, that was, it's been a fun night, Tyler. So good on you. Good job. Thanks. Have a, have a, there you go. Thanks. Well, give a shout out to Katie and Matt for giving us this bourbon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, friend Katie, friend Matt. I hope you're listening. Um, sorry, I, I am texting her to ask how she's feeling right now um, and also tell her that she'll get that question on Thursday. She's probably concussed. Uh, no, I think she was good. EMS good. was there, and they said they thought she didn't have a concussion and she didn't need stitches Thank or goodness. anything. So, um, so this bourbon, this yeah. bourbon. I, I threw some water drops in there right uh while we were waiting on the music for trivia, trivia with Tyler. I forgot to put water drops in until just now, so I'm doing that. I know, I failed. Um, and I took a sip, but I, it didn't really register with me. I didn't get to pay attention to it. So. All right. Well, I can say without the water, um, as I've been sipping it, the flavor hasn't really changed. The burn hasn't really changed. It's been very um, uh, equal. Like the, It's been very the same. It hasn't morphed at all. Um, the whole way through, but it, it hasn't been like that. It, that isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just isn't something that uh, is evolving with time and the more you drink it. Um, so, I mean, you took another sip with water. How are you feeling? I feel like it, um, it kind of dulled things. It, it, it definitely took away from it. It diluted yes, it. Yes, it did. And, um, yeah, it's, that's, I would do that for my friend that doesn't really like bourbon. Yeah. It, like here, throw an ice ball in there and have some water and yeah, a little little bit of alcohol flavor. Um, yeah, I'm very disappointed. It diluted it a lot. Um, I think I lost like 95 percent of the fruit. Um, pretty much all the sweetness is just kind of like mer. Yeah, it it pretty um, much went to just grain. Yeah, it's just grain and. It brought out for me at least char. Um, I I get now the like burnt char flavoring of those oak uh, barrels. See, I've had that the whole time. Oh, I have not. So, um, yeah. Well, uh, mm. 
I am kind of surprised. <laughs> Megan had to chase that one down. She did not like it with the water. Well, I almost shot it back up through my nose, and I'm trying to avoid coughing. Ah. So why did you almost shoot it back through your nose? Because I swallowed it wrong. Oh Lord! So it like went in like this much into my nose canal mm. before I was like, wait, 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 <laughs> get back down there. <laughs> Don't choke on the thing like you've done before. Yeah. I think I've been the only person to ever choke on our podcast, and I think it's happened more than once. So let's avoid that. Well, I'm I'm not immune to it by any means i've done it plenty of times off the podcast so uh yeah i i like this a lot better without uh water in it agreed and i i can't say um i can't say for certain where they got this i i know matt is from california so they might have actually picked it up in california i've never seen this on this side of the country um so I will hopefully find out. Matt or Katie, if you listen to this, email us. Contact us know, at Whiskey yeah. and Wonder. Yeah. Contact at WhiskeyandWonder.com and let us know. All right, Megan. Um, Numbers. 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 Talk numbers um, to me. I mean, this is a, it's a bourbon bourbon. Um, Ed. I think if you are, um. For, so for my palate, if you are someone who enjoys the burn of spicy food, um, not like a warm burn or like the typical alcohol burn, like this is literally for me the entire time it has been a spicy food, like pepper burn. Um, I think if you like that sensation, this will be a bourbon you definitely want to pick up and try. Um I I like spicy food, but I can like give or take it. Like I'm not obsessed with it. Houston loves spicy. The oh my god! Spicier it is, the better. I've seen Houston eat a bag of like Carolina Reaper. No, um, yeah, yeah, no. Chips. It was like not, like the next level above flaming hot Cheetos. He just sat there and ate the whole bag without anything to drink. Yeah, and, and he just then was like, "Can I have some more?" Yeah, like Jesus Christ. Yeah, he can get How does the he not shit fire. I he can get like the extra extra spicy hot stuff from like Indian food places and he's fine. Like the stuff where they go like don't give that to the white boy. He I can have I, that stuff. I am that white boy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Houston says. <laughs> um yeah, okay, well. So, for Houston, I'm going to give this a 6. It's a bit above average for bourbon. Interesting. I still disagree with everything you said flavor wise, basically <laughs> um, the entire time, except for adding water. I stand by what I said. I got a lot of, a lot of grain, a little bit of, of like apple, um, not really much citrus, but apple right on the tongue. And then it transitioned into a sweet vanilla caramel. Um, and it got a little leathery, charry, uh, not leathery, uh, chari oaky in the middle there. So, um, I'll, I'll put it this way. I'm excited to, to share this with my friends on Thursday, um, that, that I always share with, and I'm, I'm interested to see what they say about it since we've had such contrasting, uh, thoughts on it. Mm-hmm. And I feel like this is something, it's an easy drinker for me. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's not, not the most flavorful thing I've ever had in the world, but it's not the, I mean, it's pretty bland if you add water to it. I definitely wouldn't be drinking it like that. No, 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 um, no. But it's not the blandest thing I've ever had either. I'm, I'm going to give it a solid five and a half, slightly above average. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I guess that about wraps up episode 85, y'all. Sorry for the camera, uh, <laughs> issues. I, hmm, still pissed about that. So it's okay. 
Every little thing is going to be all right. Story, a story of my life. <laughs> the sad price is right. Music is the story of my life. Um, um, all right. Do you have anything to say, Tyler? Uh, no, I guess not. Um, no. Okay. Not really. I'll try to have the cameras running better next week. All right. Cool beans. Uh, definitely take a moment and go check out those photos from the telescopes if you have not yet, uh, because they are just awe, awe inspiring, amazing. Um, other than that, you know, thank you guys for sticking around. Thank you to all of our donators and our uh, Patreons. And, yes, we love you guys. Yeah. And thank you. Like, subscribe, review. Give us five stars. Do all the amazing things that keep us uh, running and start getting us up the charts. Um, that being said, we will see you next week for another episode of Whiskey and Wonder. Thank you guys so much. Have a good week. Don't drink and drive. Cheers. Cheers.